Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, September 22nd, and we are picking up in our our trilogy. 23rd. 22nd. 23rd. Whichever 22nd. it is, we're on Wednesday. <laughs> okay? We are in our trilogy of Romans 9, 10, and 11. And we are all ready for chapter 11 now. Remember we see in Romans 9, Israel past. Romans 10, Israel present. Romans 11, Israel future. And you might say, well then, what does that have to do with me? Why do I want to study Israel's future? Hmm. Well, number one. Because it wouldn't be here besides. Jesus. I love it. I, lo I don't need to teach. I got great answers. <laughs> One saying we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the, the Jewish people. The other saying that, that it does affect our future. And yes, we it do does. know. It does. At, at Israel, absolutely. Israel is God's time clock. If you want to know where he is on his prophetic program, you look at Israel. If you want to be in tune with, with what is the apple of his eye, and I do not mean the rebellious. Israel, but the spiritual Israel, then then you want to know. And uh, <clears throat> there's a whole lot more reason than that. But I'll drop that at this point because I want to get us in. We've looked at the end of chapter 10 where we left off last time that we read that as for Israel, God said, I've spread out my hands all the day long to a disobedient and an obstinate people. So all day long, he's reaching out with open arms, pleading with them, come, come, come. But they remain as a whole, a disobedient and an obstinate people. And on the basis of that, because as a nation, they weren't willing to be in obedience to the Lord, has he rejected all of Israel? Or is there just a temporary change? Is there a separation? Is there a partial? What is going on? I especially bring it out because there is a prevalent teaching that says that, yes, God is done with Israel. He's rejected her. He has replaced her. It's called replacement theology. It's called supersessionism because it supersedes. And I say if God changes his mind and throws out something on the basis of people, oh, look out, church, because I don't think we as a people are doing a whole lot better than the Jewish nation themselves did. And if we got a fickle God, I would say, Lord, help us all, but where would we turn? God have mercy on us if uh, God have mercy. So like yes. <laughs> if they pull the money away. If I um, sound like Amir Sarfati, I'm blessed. You do. I remember saying something like that. <laughs> okay. And Loretta is saying if we don't stand with Israel, look out also. All this is true, but let's see what Romans 11 says, because even though obviously it's pertinent to today in the year 2021, it was just as important in Shaul Paul's day, which was in the first century AD. This is, this is right into the Romans. I'm just going to give an approximate. Let's go around 50. It's probably a little later, uh, but it definitely was, yeah, it could be the late 50s, but it definitely was before the the mid to late 60s when Shaul Paul is escorted into heaven. So we know it was before he died, in other words. But <clears throat> he says, I, being Paul speaking, I say that God has not rejected his people, has he? No. Now, the way that is constructed in, the, um, in the, the Greek that we have, in the manuscripts that we have, it's not saying, has he? But it's saying, Obviously, he is not. It's expected to be that kind of an answer. But what is this being based on? I say that on the basis of what I've just revealed in chapters 9 and chapters 10. And if you want to look at just specific verses, look at verses 16 to 33 in chapter 9. Look at verses 19 to 21 in chapter 10, dealing with Israel's unbelief. We're not denying that Israel as a whole is a people that that we're living in unbelief but has God then rejected his people and the Greek again necessitates a negative answer Paul is not raising a question he doesn't have a doubt he is declaring he is bringing out the fact that God is not dead the Greek could say God did not cast away his people did he 
here's the proof, okay? Rejected, cast away, thrust off, repelled, repudiated, replaced, all of these words. And when it's referring to his people, on the basis of keeping it in context, we know that we're talking about national Israel. So is God done with the nation of Israel? He's already given it from the Greek um, sentence structure that he's, he's not raising that question as a possibility. And he follows it with the next words that he, in my version says, far from it. You may have God forbid. You have, must have some other excl exclamation that is so strong it could even be Shaul Paul saying may that never be don't even think don't even go there that's not even a possibility that's what he's trying to say now why can Shaul Paul be so secure why can he stand dogmatic and strong go out on that limb and know he's not going to fall off it's on the basis of his knowledge of his God how does he know his God he knew the word of God. He knew the scriptures. What did you say? I said it is written. It is written. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Dora, you need to be your teacher with me today. You're just A++. Let's look at some of that. Let me take you back to the first prophet, Samuel, Shmuel. We want to go to 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12, and I will read verse 22. 1 Samuel 12 and verse 22, we read, For the Lord will not abandon his people on account of, boy, would we be in trouble if I read there, on account of their good behavior, on account of them doing right, on account of them meriting it with God. But we don't read any of those words. He says I, that the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name on the name of Adonai, on the name of our God, because of his great name, he will not abandon his people. Because, the, the rest of verse 22, because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. Now, there's one witness. Let's get another witness. You know how we, we build our cases with witnesses. We're going to go to Psalm, to Helene, Psalm 94. And this would be by David now, David. Psalm 94 and verse 14, and we read almost the same phrase. It starts off with, for the Lord will not abandon his people, nor will he abandon his inheritance. He inherits them in the person of the Son, becoming one um, human like them in Jewish genealogy, being the kinsman redeemer, the one that all is his, and we become joint heirs with him, with our elder brother and I say that in quotes in the right way we've got two witnesses let me take you to another one of our prophets Jeremiah that's Jeremiah <clears throat> go with me to Jeremiah chapter 30 and we'll look at verse 11 Jeremiah 30 and verse 11 I'm covering different portions of time Samuel deals at a time when they wanted a king David deals at a time when they are kings uh, Jeremiah is dealing with the time just before they go into Babylonian captivity. So years have passed through this time also. And in Jeremiah 30 and verse 11 we read, For I am with you, declares the Lord, to save you. For I will completely destroy all the nations where I have scattered you. Only I will not destroy you completely. But I will discipline you fairly and will by no means leave you unpunished. So the Lord's made it very clear. I'm going to scatter you. You're going to go to the woodshed. You're going to feel my punishment because you need to be corrected like a good parent would correct a wayward child. But he made it very clear. I will not destroy you completely. I will not abandon you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. So here we've got all the way through in Jewish history from before they even had a king all the way through now when I take you back to Romans all the way through to the first century A.D. with God saying again and again and again, and there are many, many other scriptures I could take you to, but they all say the same thing. God will not abandon his people. Now, here's his proof, okay? Uh, I'm back in Romans 11, and I'm still in verse 1. Oh, my tablet went back to 10. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Far from it, we've said that, 4. 
Four is the next word. This is proof of the negative answer. Proof that God will not reject. And what is the proof that Shaul Paul pulls out? He himself and I. <laughs> he says, I too, Paul is speaking, I too also am. And what is he? He's an Israelite. That means that he comes from the, the one called Israel. Actually, they were called Israelites in Yitzhak, in Isaac's day. Okay, a descendant of Abraham. That's prior to Isaac. That's Isaac's daddy. So he comes from the line of Abraham, the line of, of Isaac, and from Jacob's son, Benjamin, from the tribe of Benjamin. So he's telling them he's as Jewish as you can get, okay? He's got the, the Jewish genealogy all the way back, even before they were called Jews, all the way back to, to Abraham. If God had cast away he, the, the, what we call the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, then Shaul Paul would be cast away. He couldn't be one that God had a relationship with. He would have been excluded. And we can follow that testimony down to this very point today where I could stand in Paul's shoes, except for the fact that I cannot declare I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Today we don't know what tribe we're from. I have a, a hint, a hope, but we'll leave that out. I know I'm from one of the tribes, and that's all that matters. I know I'm descended from Abraham and Yitzhak. In the same way that Shaul Paul was not abandoned because God doesn't abandon his people, I too am another one not abandoned. Even though I am Jewish and even though my nation is in rebellion, I have a personal relationship with my God who has not abandoned my people, not abandoned my nation, is allowing them to come to that point of those consequences we just read about, not left wholly unpunished. And I pray for them to come to, to know him so that they won't have to go through a more severe punishment to come back into that right relationship with him. But being an Israelite, Paul's declaring he was a member of God's theocracy. And that meant that he was an heir to the promises given to the nation of Israel. And that's true for any who are of the nation of Israel. They are of the seed, the offspring. That's why he shows it goes on past Abraham. The promises given to Abraham were passed to Isaac were passed to Jacob and we read that we're going to see all three of those in detail when we uh, are in the book of Genesis starting very soon in Bereshit we will see when God gave promise to Abraham and what he promised we'll see when it's carried down to Isaac and not to Ishmael we'll see when it's carried down to Jacob and not to Esau and we'll see what that means all the way down the line but we understand here very clearly that the promises to the, the theocracy the commonwealth of Israel Paul is declaring his right to that, that this very day as the offspring. And the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, along with the tribe of Judah, Judah made up the southern kingdom of Judea. So he's, he's claiming he was right with them. Even when the ten northern tribes went into um, captivity for their rebelliousness, their idolatry, the two southern tribes stayed with their God a while longer. Finally, in Jeremiah's day, we see that even changes, that he's of one of those tribes that stayed with them. So, Shaul Paul is so confident because he belongs to the Lord, and he knows that, that that's his heritage, and God is still at work. Verse 2 continues it. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Okay, what does that mean, foreknew? Because now we've got a because of clause. What does that mean? Well, foreknowing is foreordained. It's according to previous knowledge. God knew ahead of time. He knew, knew that the nation would receive him in time. He knew that they would reject him when he came as suffering servant. But he knows that there will come the day when the nation will say, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And when he hears that, and at the time that he's hearing that, it's at the time of his coming to set up that millennial kingdom to fulfill the promises that he made to the nation of Israel. So God knew that in time this nation would turn right toward God. Let's look at Romans chapter 8. We're in 11, but just go back to 8. We studied um, Romans 9, starting with 9. But let's look toward the end of Romans 8 and see another proof there. Remember, this is a continuous letter. Chapter 8, verse 30. 
We'll go, uh, sorry, verse 29. We'll start in 29. We'll do 29 and 30. Uh, remember, it's a continuous letter. It doesn't start and stop like we do with our chapters and verses. <clears throat> so, uh, so just prior to telling us about Israel's past and her rebelliousness, he's saying in verse 29 of chapter 8, for those whom he foreknew, same language that we're just talking about, those he knew ahead of time, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He knew who would choose him. So he predestined them to choose him. He, he, no one comes to the Father, but he draws them by the Spirit of God. So he, he predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son, who is the express glory of God. That means a right relationship with him so that he would be, Yeshua, in his flesh, the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. When Yeshua is called the firstborn or the only begotten of God, that's position, that's rank. He is first, he inherits everything. He is the son that inherits from the father. We are joint heirs with him that we come into those promises also. But this is saying very clearly that, that he foreknew and conformed those that he knew to be drawn to him, to become in the part of the family. So that verse 30, we can read those he predestined, he also called. Remember that you don't come if God doesn't call you. And those whom he called, he justified. Justified is as if you hadn't sinned. So he called you, you responded, and he gave you the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus so that he could see you as sin free, so you could be in his presence. And that's how those he justified, he glorified. Now, we're walking around today, sorry to say, not looking very glorified. We're in our unglorified appearance here on this earth. But when the Father looks at us, who have opened our hearts, and at this point, Shaul Paul is talking specifically about Jewish believers, although we know it's true today for Gentiles, but the Jewish believers whose hearts are right with God because he foreknew and he predestined them and he called them. They came, they responded, and he was able to cover, well, actually wash away their sin in the shed blood, perfect sinless blood of Messiah, Savior, Yeshua, Jesus, so that they would be in the glorified state he sees as if it's already done. Remember, God's not in time. God is above time. We see time. We're studying past, present, and future right now. But before there was a past, we go into eternity past, and that's really uh, an oxymoron, because how do you have past when you have eternity that, that never began? And how do you take that eternity to the future? But that's where our God is. He sees it all. Best way that I can describe it is using Adrian Rogers' uh, picture. You go to the Rose Parade on January 1st. You sit on the sidewalk. You see when the parade starts, you see the parade go by you, and you see the parade end. But if you could get up in a helicopter and look down, you can see the beginning and the end of the parade before it's ever even happened to whoever's sitting right there in the middle, you know, watching it go on. That's like how our God is. He sees the beginning and the end of our life, our time, our existence here on this earth, but he is before and he is after and in that in that that great knowledge that foreknowledge he preordained he predestined he called he conforms to his image who's doing it do you hear the common denominator he 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 god does it all thank god because if it were dependent on me like walt there would be no hope <laughs> just very honestly we need, we need we need God to do it all we just need to be conformed to that image allow him to change us to make us what he sees us as um, okay so going back to chapter 11 we're going we're still I think we're yes we're in the second verse 11 and verse 2 when we go back there uh, we understand now that it's saying God's not rejected his people whom he foreknew. He spared and he saved the believing remnant. And that's true all the way through time. That's true all the way back at the beginning. People ask, is Adam in heaven? Well, why would you have a problem with that? 
God prepared a sacrifice for Adam. That yes, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, not out of God's plan, his world, his everything. They were kicked out of the garden. They were kicked out of the garden for a good reason. Thank you, God. Do you realize why they were kicked out of the garden? There's something in that garden. It was called the tree of life. If they ate from that tree, they would continue to live forever eating from that tree. That means that in their sinful state, they would have gone on forever like that, never an end. Can you imagine this forever? I wouldn't want a part of it. I'd want to escape. I'd want to commit suicide. I'd want to get out of this. But God in his mercy removed them where they could not eat from the tree and live physically continually so that there would come the time that the body decaying now, which it would not have done if Adam and Eve had not sinned, now does come to a point where the body ends, the soul is free to go into its eternal state in the presence of the Holy God or away from the presence of the Holy God, depending on what they've done with the, the testimony of Yeshua Jesus, because that testimony was given all the way back in the beginning. So Adam and Eve showed by being obedient to God by making the sacrifice, they were looking forward to the time when Yeshua Jesus would come and shed his blood. The same way Samuel or David or Moses or whoever you want to say the same as they. So there's no reason why Adam and Eve would be excluded from being in the presence of the Lord forever as long as they came to him for the forgiveness of their sin. They knew they'd done wrong. They were repentant. They paid a high price. And we're in that to this day because even all creation suffers the consequences of their disobedience. But God, knowing, knowing how this could play out in his divine plan, wow, made a way to bring humankind back into that relationship with him. And that is nothing but amazing. Amazing grace, amazing God. Yes. Anybody who thinks they can orchestrate better than God, oh, no way. Oh, no way. <laughs> they've got a real problem. Yes, Dora. Is this going to be the same tree we're going to eat out of? In heaven, yes. The tree of life is described in Revelation in our heavenly, yes, yes. But uh, um, not till we're on that here too. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> back to verse 2. So God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Okay? Um, and if you have the old King James, the word is what, W-O-T, that means no. No in an absolute manner. I was always wondering. Okay, yes. <laughs> It's old English. Okay. okay, so yes, yes. What's the word? What, W-O-T. Yeah, the old English, yes. That? Yeah, that, that's no in an absolute manner. That's not a, I think so, that's a no so. Okay, he knows. So, he's, he, or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Eliyahu, Elijah? He's going to use Elijah now for an example. What he used of Elijah is very interesting because it's a negative, okay? But he uses it for a great example. What did Elijah do? He pleaded with God, and catch the next word, against Israel. He didn't stand in the gap and plead for God to spare Israel the way we hear Moshe say, God, don't wipe out the people. If you're going to wipe them out, wipe me out too. But for your name's sake, don't do that because the, the nations will say, Look at how weak that God of Israel was. Moshe stood in the gap, but Eliyahu, Elijah, the period of time that he pulls out for an example, he pleaded against Israel. Okay, he was making intercession against Israel, not for Israel. Let's go read about that so that we understand why he did that. We want to. Elijah. Yes. Uh, Should be Elijah. Well, it says Elijah. What the scripture says of Elisha, how he made an intercession to God against Israel, saying, Okay. That's the old case. The, yeah, the rest of it is right, but it really is Elijah. Okay. 
and the proof of that is 1 Kings 19, and we're just going to look at 10 and 14. If you don't know the story, this is when... What chapter 19? Chapter 19. This is when Elijah challenges the prophets of Jezebel, okay? Yes. Ahab and Jezebel, Ahab and Jezebel, yes. okay? This is when he, he tells them, you know, he can, he's going to call out fire from heaven. They, they want to yeah. say they can do it too, you know, to show whose God is real, whose God is alive. And we know there's only one living God, the, one true and living God of Israel. So they do all their dancing and they're trying and they're trying to get the attention and Elijah has a little bit of fun with it and pokes fun at them. Oh, you know, speak a little louder. Maybe he's napping. Maybe he went to the bathroom, you know, whatever. <laughs> but he even pokes fun at them because he is so secure. And when they've tried all day long and fire has not come and consumed their sacrifice, then he takes his sacrifice and he has it absolutely soaked, drenched. To prove that there's no magic trick, there's nothing, it's not by his power. Y'all know something that's really wet is hard to catch on fire. Right. But God is going to have no issue because he is God. And when Elijah bowed before his God and asked his God to bring fire out of heaven, it consumed the sacrifice and it soaked up or it drenched up, what's the word I want, dried up. It dried up all the trench of water that was around it also. Elijah was showing the power of his God. Uh, when we read in verse 10 of chapter 19, it says, And he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of armies, for the sons of Israel have abandoned your covenant. They've torn down your altars, they've killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they've sought me to take my life. Now, how did he go from one to the other? I think out of pure exhaustion, he got to the point where he had, he had taken on the prophets of Baal, he had slain them in the valley, I, 300 that day, I think it was? A thousand. Was it a thousand? Okay, okay. I should have looked at my facts. It's right, right there, just before chapter 19. You can read it on your own. All the prophets were slain. This was a mountaintop experience, but this was exhausting. And in his exhaustion, he, he ends up running. And yet God still worked with him and uh, fed him and slept him and then talked to him and got him back in the game. What I don't understand is, is how one man, and they all sit still for him to kill him? I mean, there's a thousand. He yeah. was a, he's the one that put them to death, but there had to have been others that confined them, yeah. soldiers that confined them. Had to be. That's yeah. too many for one man all of a sudden. Yeah, because it doesn't say that God froze him in place or anything like that. <laughs> so that he was the one responsible. He was the one taking the yeah. action and all of that. But he at, at this point where he's tired, where he's warm, he sees that he's been zealous for his God. But he sees the rebelliousness of his people and he thinks that they're all off idol worshiping also and he's so discouraged because they have literally killed prophets that were there to speak for God. He, they have torn down the altars that were to worship their God and built up idolatrous altars. They had done everything that he had said here, that they were not following the covenant that God made with them. They were not keeping the law that they were to keep. So he's calling them out and he's right. They're, they're not keeping the covenants. They are killing the prophets. And what was the third thing? And they have torn down the altars of worship to the true God and, and put up false altars to false gods. So he's right. This is not a people that you could say, wow, they deserve for God to do something great for them. And Elijah was so fed up with it all that he did say, it's they're gone. It's just me, God. They've abandoned you. He is so discouraged at this point. Find out later, no. Look at verse 14, though. Yeah. Um, oh, no. 14 uh, it also repeats it, okay? God showed him his power. He's taken him and showed him the, the shaking of the mountains, the, the earthquake, the fire, and then he speaks to him in the, the still, small voice, okay? And because I didn't write down the verse... Um, Oh, it's verse 18. It's verse 18. Was it yes, First Kings 19. Verse 18 was, was God's answer to El Eliyahu. He said, Yeah, I will leave, or I have left 7,000 in Israel. 
7,000, he thinks he's the only one, 7,000, all the knees have not bowed to Baal, every mouth that has not kissed him, kissed his, his idol, his altar, and worshiped him. So where Elijah fell alone, there were still 7,000 that were standing with God. But Elijah in his weakness, um, and we go back to Romans 11, Elijah in his weakness felt that he was all alone. And in that, I think because he had tried and tried and tried and they continued in such a rebellious heart, he was just fed up with them and thought, you know, and he, and he pleaded against them, um, you know, and here it's quoted in verse 3. Lord, they've killed your prophets. They've torn down your altars. I alone am left. And they're seeking my life. They want to kill me. In other words, get rid of them, God. They're my enemy. Get rid of them before they kill me too. And you've got nobody left. But what is the divine response to him? Verse 4. I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Okay, so even though he felt utter dejection, even though he had tried to tear down, demolish, destroy, pull down, and all of this evil that was going on, still the divine response, 1 Kings 19, 18 again, and also recorded here in Romans, God says, for myself, for me. That indicates that God had a purpose of his own identifying with them. He's not just saying it's that people. He's calling them his people. I, for myself, I've kept 7,000 who are of such a character that they are right with me. God always has kept a remnant. Mm -hmm. You can't judge by outward appearance. Apparently, Eliyahu could not see what God could see in their heart for whatever reason. And I just say that when you are discouraged, that you are standing alone, God may have a whole host of angels around you, let alone earthly people to encourage and to support you. When we go into verse 5, we're going to see again now we're talking about that there being a spiritual Israel within the national Israel, the nation of Israel. Not all the nation of Israel is right with their God. In Eliyahu's day, 7,000 were right. I don't know how many were alive then, but only 7,000 were right with their God. But remember, God always keeps that remnant. And verse 5 says, in the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time, in Shaul Paul's day, a remnant according to God's gracious choice. So, therefore, in the same way, at this present time, if you have season, it means right, you know, in Paul's day when he was talking, this period of time that he's referring to, we call it the age of grace. In the age of grace, God still has a remnant of believing Jews. That's what he's saying. He's not giving up on the nation of Israel in the age of grace. We see a rebellious nation. We see hearts that are not turned toward God. I know someone who went to Israel on tour expecting it to be the holy land and a holy people. <laughs> and they were amazed when they found it a very European country and a lot of going on that, that is not what is of God. Are there people in that land who are holy in right relationship with God and serving him? Yes, God keeps his remnant, okay? So, um, and by the way, the Greek tense, that there's come to this day also shows a permanence. It's not that, that they can be lost even. They are permanently kept. God permanently keeps a remnant. God is faithful, and he is the one doing it. The remnant means to leave. That's a group of Israel that's left out of the general population, I'll say. The general population we could see in apostasy that God's brought people out. They've left that apostasy. The same way Eliyahu, Elijah, was apart from those who were bowing to those other idols and, and you know, worshiping the false gods. Okay, so that's what it's saying. And this remnant that he's saying, he says that he's kept them, God has kept them all the way to that present time, which is still true today, according to to God's gracious choice. You may have the word election in there according to God's election. Election or chosen, whatever word we're putting there, that means to pick out. It chooses out from a number. So God has chosen out of the whole, he has chosen some for himself 
that are his believing remnant. And how did he choose them? Well, we just read that a little earlier, remember? According to his foreknowledge. He chose knowing who would be faithful to him. He chose them and drew them unto him so that they would be faithful to him. It all starts with God. It doesn't start with man. Man doesn't go seeking God on his own. He doesn't suddenly decide one day I'll be good. No, God tugs at that heart. The Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, convicts of that sin, draws them, brings them in to that point where they open their heart into relationship with him. But he knows who will do that. God knows it all. He knows it all, and he chooses all who will because he's not willing that any should perish. And this is on the basis of his, and we read the word in a different form. We read gracious, but that's just simply the basis of his grace. And I ask you, what is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. They didn't earn it. They didn't deserve it. That excludes every bit of human work. If there's any human work, it's not grace. And if it's grace, there's no human work. The two are exact opposites. They do not go together. So God's making it very clear. No one did it on their own. No one decided to be right and got right with God. No one chose, no one initiated, and no one lived it without God drawing them and then pouring his grace out on them to enable them to come into that relationship that he wants with all his people. Okay? So, all on the basis of God's grace, and that's what verse 6 tells us. But if it is by grace, and that word if would be better translated since in our English. The Greek word can mean either, and when you understand the context, you know that it's saying then, so since it is by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works, since otherwise grace is no longer grace. Okay, if it's out of the source of works, if it's based on works, if it starts with works, if there's even one work, then it's not grace. It gives up the specific character of what grace is. You didn't start it, you didn't earn it, and you don't keep it. It's all done out of God's grace. That means if in that sixth verse by grace, that means since. Since, since yeah. Better translated since. Yes. Yeah, it, it's not that if, it's since it, we know it's by grace, then we know it's not by works. Remember, they're looking to the law to save them. That's why it says it's no longer on the basis of works. God gave them the law to show them they couldn't keep the holy standard of God and needed his grace. If he had not given them law, they wouldn't know their need. Before law, he gave them conscience. That conscience pricked them. That conscience let them know they weren't right before God. God works in different ways to show humankind you can't do it. You won't do it. You aren't able to do it. It's all by his grace. His grace, his grace alone, and I thank God continually, daily, for his grace that reached down and saved one such as I. So what then? Verse 7. What's the truth of the matter then? What Israel is seeking... Oh, let me finish this. Let me put in there what then. Remember his first question. He's building on that first question. Since God didn't cast Israel aside for good, then where does she stand now? How does she shape it in? What's going on now? Because we know that, that, that as a whole, the nation did reject. So what now? What's the truth? What's going on? What Israel is seeking. In Greek, what Israel is continually seeking. But hasn't obtained okay she wants something but she hasn't gotten it what is she wanting um lost my place sorry Seven. there we go and the rest oh okay wait a minute. okay what what then what israel is seeking it or he or she however you, you've got it has not obtained but those who were chosen obtained it and the rest were hardened those who were chosen, those who were elected, those who God chose, because remember, it's by his choosing. He did his choosing on the basis of his foreknowledge, but those he chose are the ones who have obtained it. 
What happened to the rest of Israel? Because remember we're saying there's only a small remnant that has been chosen. There's only a small remnant that has responded to God's calling. The rest were hardened. The rest were blinded. The Greek means to cover with a thick skin or to harden by covering with a callus. Thus it makes the heart dull. It makes a, a hardening, a callousness petrified. Hardening of the arteries leads to death of the heart. Okay? And that's what it's saying. That's what's happened to the rest. They've been hardened. They've been blinded. They're callous. It's hard for them to hear. They're dull of hearing. There's a veil of blindness we know described over their eyes. So we see that we have a problem for the general population of Israel. That God has a remnant who are not hardened, who are not hard of hearing and seeing, and who have hardened hearts. Now, before we go into verse 8, it's going to, well, let me read verse 8 to you before I break down some of it. I want to take you to some references to help you understand. A lot of people really struggle with this. It's, you have to hear the whole to get the balance, okay? Just as it's written, God gave them a spirit of stupor. That, that's, okay, stupidity comes to mind. Stupor is like a drunken stupor. They're not, they're, they're not seeing it. They're not catching it. They're not getting it. Okay. That's called slumber. Slumber. Okay. Okay. Eyes to see not and ears to hear not down to this very day. Now, people jump all over this and they build that whole doctrine replacement theology. See, 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 God chose to blind them. God chose to give them that slumber or that, that stupor, that drunkenness. God chose them not to hear and it's right down to this very day. God's done. He's done away with them. That's not what God is saying. There is a result out of what they have done that we see in their callousness. We see in the hardening of the heart. We see in the blindness. But it is not saying that God went eeny, meeny, miny, mo. You can get it and you can't. I want you and I don't want you. <laughs> that If that were true, then throw out John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life you couldn't say that that would not be accurate god is not a liar god is truth and his whole word is true so obviously you have a problem if that's your doctrine and there are a lot of people that say well the jews don't deserve it right but no one deserves it no, no one, yeah. <laughs> the whole world doesn't deserve it so let's look and put these verses in their context and see what it means when it says God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, ears to hear not. Let's go back into our Jewish history because this is what Paul's drawing on. Let's go to Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy 29, and we're going to look at verse 2. Davarim 29, verse 2. Moshe, Moses, summoned all of Israel and said to them, you have seen all the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all his servants and all his land. Okay? The children of Israel, you have seen what God did for us before Pharaoh and all his servants when you were in the land of Egypt. The great trials which your eyes have seen, verse 3, those great signs and wonders. The ten plagues. Oh my goodness, if that didn't show whose God is alive and whose God is at work, what would show them? What, what would it take? I mean... Hello? <laughs> and by the way, remember, all those plagues were against the Egyptian gods, with the exception of the, the final. But uh, the gnats and the flies and all that, those were the gods they were worshiping. And it, it showed them, you know, who's got the power? Who is God of it all? Okay? So, verse 4, Yet to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. Okay? Again, it's sounding like, he blocked it off from them, but this is not in the character of our God. Let me give you a few more examples and then explain to you what we are really seeing in these verses. Because if you take them out and jump on them, it can sound deathly to, to the Jew. Okay? Isaiah, Yeshua, chapter 29 and verse 10 says, For the Lord has poured over you a spirit of deep sleep, 
He's shut your eyes, the prophets. The prophets, your eyes are shut. He's covered your heads, the seers. The seers were like the prophets that would foretell. And it sounds again like God is keeping them from it. That's Isaiah 29, verse 10. And Isaiah 29, verse 13 says that the Lord said, Because this people approaches me with their words and honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me, and the reverence for me consists of, consists of the commandment of men that is taught. They're listening to man. They're following man's teaching rather than having their hearts toward God. They'll say it with their lips, but they're not. it's not in their heart. Okay, again, it's sounding condemning. Let's keep reading. Let's go into Matthew, Mattathiah, chapter 13. This is another time in Israel, Israel's history when... Uh, with her is the Messiah. He's not recognized by them as such, but we know Yeshua Jesus is their Messiah. Matthew 13, verses 13 through 15. Therefore I speak to them in parables. This is Yeshua Jesus speaking. Because while they, because while seeing, they do not see. While hearing, they do not hear, and they do not understand. He sounds like he's picking up right off of Isaiah and Deuteronomy, what we read, okay? And this is Yeshua Jesus' own words. In their case, verse 14, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. You shall keep on listening, but not understand. You'll keep on looking, but you won't perceive. For the heart of the people has become dull. Their ears, they scarcely hear. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. Okay, do you notice what's being said? If they would turn him, he would heal them. So obviously it's not he forcing it on them. It's not his desire for them. Let me give you one more. Um, oh, before we leave Matthew, notice also, tuck this in your mind because I'll come back to it in a moment. Verse 16 says, but blessed are your ears because they see. Let's try your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Okay, so the Lord is condemning those who are not seeing and hearing and at the same time saying, but there are those of you right here who are hearing and seeing. Okay, now I'm going to take you to one more. I'm going to take you to John 12, but remember that last phrase in Matthew. Yohanan, John chapter 12, and we're going to read 37 to 40. John 12, 37 to 40. But though he had performed so many signs in their sight, they were still not believing in him. As Yeshua Jesus worked his ministry, he worked miracle after miracle. He healed the blind, he unstopped ears, he raised the dead, he walked on the water, he, he showed many times, many ways, many sights, um, what did it say? Sights and I think it used something else. Um, I'm looking 37. Signs in their sight. It just says that. Okay. But they were still not believing in him. This happens so the word of Isaiah the prophet which he spoke would be fulfilled. The prophet Isaiah said, Lord, who's believed a report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, he's blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they won't see with their eyes and they won't understand with their heart. They won't be converted and they, I will not heal them. So again, it sounds very much like the Lord's doing it to them. But the real understanding of what's being said in each of these is this is the people's action. Because they won't see, because they won't hear, because they won't open their hearts. The Lord can't heal them. The Lord is not going to force himself on anyone. That is not how you get saved. He doesn't come and clobber you on the head and say, you have to do this. He pleads. He gives opportunity. And remember how I brought out before, if you take a lump of wax and you take a lump of clay and you put them both in the sun, one melts and one hardens. When God was revealing to them and they were hardening their hearts, it's because they were being that clay. The more they saw, the more they heard, the harder they got against God. They became more and more rebellious against him. Those were the ones that could not be healed. Even when we read in, um, well, it's still here. Verse 42 in John tells again, even though he's just said that there are all these who aren't seeing, aren't hearing, hard in their hearts, but verse 42 says, nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in him. 
because, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him so that they would not be excommunicated from the synagogue. The Pharisees were the ones speaking against Yeshua. And so the people were afraid of the Pharisees, afraid of their rulers and their leaders, afraid that they'd be kicked out if they said anything against them. And fearing being kicked out of the synagogue meant being kicked out of the commonwealth of Israel, meaning they'd miss out on God's blessings. They were staying silent about it, but they were believing. That would be those who are secret believers today that are afraid to step out because they live in a land, a place where it could be death to them, and so they're careful about their testimony. Look at fear. Fear, again, it, it, it enables people, even with all the miracles, how can you right. and, not believe that? And that's the whole question. With all the signs and wonders he did, how could they not believe? That's, what, that's why who now. is hardening the heart who is closing the eyes who is closing the ears they're choosing not to hear not to see and not to believe and when they choose that then the lord cannot heal them they have to be open to allowing him to heal another time um, in isaiah if we'd read further down he made the expression go make the heart of this people fat and shut their eyes this helps us understand how is Isaiah going to go make the heart of the people fat and shut their eyes? Yeah. He's going to do it by preaching to them. He's going to do it by bringing the truth to them. It's their response that we're seeing, but that's how they're hardened. He's going to go proclaim the law of the Lord and that they're rejecting it. And they're going to get upset at him for it. They're going to close their eyes to it. They're going to close their ears. They're going to kill the prophets. They're going to excommunicate the prophets. They're going to push away even Yeshua, who did the miracles right, right in front of them. And yet they're pushing him away. So that brings that hardness. Rhonda, you have a question? Can you unmute yourself? Zoom out there. Keep trying. Keep trying. Where's he at? <laughs> Close my mic. I mean, don't you know Rob Murphy? <laughs> okay, you can't get it back. Okay, is it short enough you can text it to me? If so, do that. If not, my techie will be right here to try to try. While you're doing that, let me go on and, and say, okay, we're not saying that God was not reconciling with who, whosoever. What we're saying is that this effect on them is what's keeping them from being reconciled with God. The truth irritates. The truth enrages. The truth hardens unless is countered by the grace of God. When God gives the grace to believe, then they receive. So this is what they're shutting down and not allowing the grace of God to reach them because the grace of God will save whosoever will come to the Lord. But it, it, again, it's showing us there's nothing wrong on God's part. There was nothing wrong on Isaiah's part by preaching to them. It's not the indication that God's unwilling it's an indication that they are not willing, that they are closing it off. And it's shown by God bringing them the truth. It's shown by God expounding it to them. It's the same way, God forbid, but there are people in my life today who I've tried to be a witness and a light to who are right now hardening their hearts, closing their eyes, plugging up their ears. They don't want to hear it. If they continue on that way till they have left this earth, and they're standing before God one day in judgment, great white throne judgment. And they stand there and they say, well, it's your fault, God. It's your fault. You didn't reveal yourself. I could stand there in judgment, say, wait a minute. I told you and you scoffed at me. I told you, you said, I don't want to hear it. I told you and you said, no, I'm a good person. God's going to let me in because I'm a good person. That's what is happening here. By God revealing truth to them, the results are eyes being closed, ears being stopped. But it's their choice. It is them doing it. By God's grace, any of us who receive, receive. But that spirit of slumber, that death sentence, so to speak, is out of their hardened heart 
that got hardened because the light was brought to them. Do you understand the balance? Nobody's reacting. Yes, no. Okay, I got one yes and I got one iffy. Okay, Roger, can you unmute Rhonda? She has tried repeatedly and she can't get in there. And I told her to text me and it's too long to text, so. Okay, there you go, Rhonda. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little beautiful now. I hear what you're saying. <laughs> but you're not understanding. <laughs> but I don't It's hard to say. I understand because you're right on top of it. It's not really that, that you're not right. Thank you. You're right on top of it. It's, remember, they can't earn it. So it's not something that they could do and God is stopping them from doing. It's the result. Because of their disobedience, it resulted in that hardening of the heart that keeps them from salvation. But God has drawn them, God's given them the truth. There wouldn't be that hardness if they if he hadn't given them the truth. But he did bring the truth to them. They did reject it, and so their heart is hardened, and they suffer the consequences if they don't turn from that. that okay, so is it not being part of the Jewish community? Is a you know, Christian community, we're always encouraged to study our Bibles, right? Yes. Read the Old Testament, read the Old Testament, we're always studying. Yes. Is that the culture for the Jewish community to study, you know, read Genesis, read Deuteronomy? Are they, are, are most of them just to go to Sabbath, I mean, go to the well, go to church or synagogue? The religious... Are they studying that word to really be prepared to see the Messiah only comes, or are they just kind of laid back? If they had studied, they would have been prepared and they would have known when Messiah would come. I just dealt with that real strongly in my message for Yom Kippur. So I'll uh, refer to that. If people have my bit.ly site, they can go to that, look for the message on Yom Kippur because I, I brought that out very clearly in that. To answer your question here in short without going through an hour, um, the the religious Jewish people, yes, they are reading Genesis through Deuteronomy every year. We're just about at the end of Deuteronomy, and when it ends, in the very week that it ends, they start in Genesis so that there's no break. They don't finish it and then pick up the next week. They start again. They cyclically read those five books, divided into portions called parashas every week. They read it in order. Then they read after that portion of Genesis through Deuteronomy that enables them to read it in a year. They read portions of the prophets or the writings, but they skip all around and they read just portions. So they don't read controversial areas like Isaiah 53. The rabbis just guide them away from that because they tell you it's too controversial if you ask them why. So they, they get partial scripture but they don't get it at all 
But here's the, the key and the sad part. Would they study what God said and seek God's inner, um, inner acting with them to know what God said and what God means, then they would come to the truth because it's there. It's there in Genesis. It's there in Exodus. It's there in Leviticus. But they don't study the word of God. Instead, they'll study what the commentaries say. They'll study what the rabbi said. And they love to argue. It's friendly fire, but they love to argue. So this one will say, well, this rabbi says this. And they pick a revered rabbi. But this revered rabbi, he says this. And then they argue what the rabbis are saying, and they get far away from the scriptures. Because now they're arguing man's interpretation of what's being said. And the best way to witness to them is to constantly pull them back. But what does God say? Dora said it earlier in class, it is written. What does God say? Does God give an excuse? I'll give you a question in just a second so your hand doesn't get tired. But to give you that one quick example, with Yom Kippur, they cannot make an animal sacrifice today because there is no temple. It's the only place the animal sacrifice can be made. So they have substitutes for that. They have different things that they do. Get my, my teaching on it to know what they come up with, but they come up with man's reasoning. I'll just say it that way. And my question to them would be, where does God say that when you don't have the temple, you can do this? When you don't have the temple, you can do that. I'll accept that. I'll find that okay in my eyesight because we know, again, all the way back in the, the first five books in the Torah, we know that God said there is not forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. Leviticus 17, 11. And he says, I put it on the altar for you. God did it all. But instead they're saying, well, we can't shed that blood of that animal in our place. So we'll do, and they, the prayers, and, and they do a number of different things. But what does God say? Many of our Jewish people today don't know what God said. They don't study the word of God at all. I'm talking about the religious ones who go who will have some knowledge, but again, they get off track because they'll start arguing what all the rabbis have said, all the commentaries through all time, instead of staying with what does God say. And that's, that's where the conviction comes in. Get them back to the Word of God. Get them back to the Word of God. Okay, so I, I still understand. It's hard for us to understand, but my point is God doesn't willfully withhold salvation from anyone. On that foreknowledge, he chooses any and all who he knows will choose him. If he gives them a light, they will choose him. Now, he also knows the ones who won't chose, choose him, who are given that light. And so he said, I'll harden their hearts. I'll blind their eyes. I'll stop up their ears. How does he do it? By giving them the truth. What blinds you? Light blinds. The brighter the light, the more blinding if they're not coming into it, into the faith to it's believe. And it, it's the heart. It's the hardness of that heart, yes. Okay, keep thing, I'll come back to you and see if I totally answered your question or not, Dora. Well, I was going to ask, will the Lord deal with the rabbis because they could keep, they kind of miss, we he, were only there for a while. The, he <laughs> talked in, um, oh goodness, which prophet is it? The, the prophets, I think it's Isaiah, he talks about the shepherds, woe to the shepherds who have misled his sheep. Yes, the same way that the teachers of the Word of God today are held to that higher standard that, that we have to, we, and I put me in there because I'm teaching the Word of God, that I'm called to a tightrope to walk here to do it right. That's why before I enter into my teaching, believe me, in my heart, I'm on my knees saying, Lord God, teach truth for me today. Don't let me misspeak. Don't let me mislead. But woe to those who do mislead. And he, he talks specifically about the shepherds of Israel. But that would be even for false pastors today who are misleading congregations and sending them astray. Yes, they will suffer a greater they're held to the greater responsibility and they suffer a greater consequence. God does not take it lightly. The same way the Lord said, you know, if they suffer the little children to come to me, it'd be better if a millstone was tied around their neck and they were cast into the sea. You know, he, he didn't take lightly them misleading even a little child. So yes, yes, it is definitely very displeasing to God. 
and I do not want to be on that side, <laughs> ever. <laughs> just like uh, a lot of the pastors, you know, they give up the depression, they just quit. They still get away from but, you know, they know how to well. Elijah was depressed. You want to read depression? Elijah was yeah. depressed. And I tell people, look at what God did. Did God condemn Elijah? No. He let him run. He let him get away from the situation. And where he got away from it, there God fed him and slept him for 40 days. That's exhaustion, folks. That's total spent. You know, I don't know about any of you, but do you need 40 days of rest and food and rest and food? You know, the angel woke him up and said, eat, now go back to sleep. Woke him up, eat, go back to sleep. Then God said, okay, you and I, Elijah, we need to have a little talk here. <laughs> and in his, showing him his great power, he encourages him that he is still almighty God and he is in control, but he's not just in the great. He is in that still small voice within Elijah. He is there for Elijah. And he sends him back refreshed and renewed and ready to go back into the fight. And I love it. He at the same time sends him a helper. He says, go back, but you know what? I'll send you one to help. And he sends him Elisha, who ends up getting a double portion of what Elijah had when Elijah goes home in the chariot of fire. So I see God understand our humanness, take care of us in our frailties, but then it calls us up. He didn't say, yeah, you're right, Elijah. It really is bad. And, and yeah, you can stay away now. No, 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 no. Get your feet back under you, but I'm sending you back in. <laughs> but I won't even send you alone. I'll, I'll give you help. So that's our God who understands our frailties and our, our humanness. But he is going to hold these to task these who, whose eyes are blinded, not because God did it to them and they didn't have a choice, but because God did give them a choice and they chose to, to not see. They chose not hear. They chose to harden their hearts. And so they will suffer the consequences. God can't heal if they don't come to him for healing. Even the Lord said that he couldn't do any more miracles in his hometown because they wouldn't believe. Their unbelief stopped him from being able to do those miracles for them. If they're not going to believe and accept and receive from him, where does that leave them? Shut off. But they've done it to and themselves. And so many have died because of their unbelief yes. and their rebellion. Yes, yes, yes. And look at the children who perished in the wilderness because of their unbelief. They never got to go into the blessings of the promised land because of their unbelief. Unbelief cuts us off from what the Lord would do for us. But we have to see that that's an effect and result. Because otherwise, we are saying God is not true to his character. And he does pick and choose. And someone is going to help because God made him for help. God says, I never made help for people. I made it for the devil and for his angels, for those who followed him. That's who God made hell for. When man ends up in hell, it's by his own doing. He will never be able to blame God and say, well, you didn't choose me. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. God will silence every excuse. And they will see it. And they will know that they're standing there in their own sin of unbelief. Okay? Are we good? It, it is a hard concept. It, it really is. But... If you've ever been around someone that you're trying to share the truth with and it's gone on for a long time, you understand spiritual blindness and spiritual deafness. And that's really the, what it comes out of. That's willful rebellion. That's willfully saying, not your way, God, my way. And I hear, and I'm not picking on the person, but I hear that song, I did it my way. And I wonder how many people are going to stand before God and say, but I did it my way. You know, I was such a good person, God. Look at all the people I fed. I gave to the poor. And, and when they came and they knocked on my door and they needed some, I gave them. And I even gave them more than what they asked for. And I didn't ever cheat anybody. And I certainly didn't murder anybody. And they built themselves up as a good person. This also is a problem for our Jewish people who see sin as only the big, bad sins, like a murder. They don't see the continual sin. What does God call sin? Anything that falls short of God's holy, perfect standard. That's why he gave them law. 
not to, to incriminate them by it, not to say you're done in, but to show them you are done in. You need a savior. You need a redeemer. You need a, a forgiveness. And he gives it freely. Again, not that they ever merit it, but he tugs and they come and receive by his grace. He tugs and they do not receive and the result is the hardening, the blinding, and they'll go to their eternal damnation if they do not quit rejecting the truth. If they don't turn from apathy, turn from stupor, turn from whatever their heart attitude is. Can we judge that? Don't put yourself in God's place. No, 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 no. Does it take some a long time and some come fast? Yes, but that's God's business working with individual. Never sell somebody off. Never say they've heard, it's done, it's over. God alone is the only one who should ever have that right position to judge because he knows. He sees. We don't see the inside. Elijah thought he was all alone, and God said, i got 7,000 that are standing with me. We can't judge it. We don't know. Okay, so that, that slumber it is a seer, severe sorrow. It's an extreme grief. It's an insensibility. It's because they rejected the truth that they got into that stupor, that they couldn't find their way out. But if they would turn at any point, God would lead them out. God would direct them. God would bring them to that light. But the, the light rejected will blind. Okay? Kind of almost two sides of a coin. But hopefully I, I've got it across to you. We're going to keep dealing with it. So if you're not there, um, see, if, see if as we go on, if it uh, helps a little bit more, um, your understanding. We'll go ahead and go to, I think we're ready for verse 9. I need to look at verse 8. Yes, we've done 8. Okay, so Isaiah's words condemn them because it's there. Then he, Shaul Paul gives another testimony against them, another example. David says, May their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. May their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs continually. Okay, the table that he's referring to, may their table become a snare. That represents material prosperity. The bounty that God had set before them, they were feasting in it, but they were feasting in a wicked security. Okay, this could even be the Jews who were, who were um, what's the word I want, feasting in the law. The Pharisees who were saying, oh, we're keeping all the law. You know, look, we even show you, we make wide our, our, our tefillin, our factories. You know, we're doing everything bigger and better and, and really showing you. But the, there is a presumptuous confidence. That fits along with that pride of self that, that people catch, you know, we, we're catching them in. That they're saying, well, I'm a good person. Surely God will let me into his heaven. There's no reason why he would reject me. Well, that means that what they're counting on, what they're trusting in, whether it be their wealth, their their um, attitude, their you know their character, whatever they're they're um, trusting in, that becomes a snare, and that's what he means. May that may their table become a snare. The snare it brings peril, it brings loss. You you catch an animal in a snare. It, it's a trap. It's destruction, and that's what he's saying. May it be a snare. May it be a trap. Uh, hunting wild beasts to destroy them. That would be like preparing destruction for men. You know, may that happen to? May they be destroyed <laughs> from that? Uh, may it be a stumbling block, uh, the trigger that causes them to fall. To, to trip them up, a retribution to them. And that's just, they deserve it. David's saying, they've rebelled against you, God. That shouldn't be that they, they continue on and do well. That should be a boomerang on them because they're rejecting you. It should come back to haunt them. It should come back to hit them. It should come back to get them. That's what David's trying to, to say, that he wants that to happen. And how do we understand? We understand it following that. First, they wouldn't see because they couldn't see. Then they refused to see when God blinded them to it. Let me give you another example. Um, and verse 10 also, before I go to that other example, bend their backs, continually bend down. That would remind them of being a captive who's bent under a burden. And he's saying, may it happen always. May it happen forever. 
what's he drawing on? What was David drawing on? Let's go back and see it in context with David. Okay, that's Psalm 69. So we're going to go to Psalm 69, and we're going to start, um, I'm probably going to read six, uh, verse 23 to you first, but then I'm going to back up so you see the context. Psalm 69, verse 23 says, May their eyes grow dim so they cannot see, and may their hips shake continually. This is, this is anathema against them, okay? Now, who's, who's being taught that? What are, we being, what are we seeing here in Psalm 69? If we back up to verse 21, I think a lot of you will recognize 21. It says, They also gave me a bitter herb in my food. For my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Who do we read about in Scripture that said, I thirst? And they put vinegar on a sponge and offered it to him. And Dora just said it, to, to Christ, to the Messiah, to Yeshua Jesus on the cross, okay? So we see that, that, that what we're seeing from verses 20 and 21, actually 21 also. Disgrace has broken my heart. I'm so sick. I waited for sympathy, but I, there was none for the comforters, but I found them. The Lord was looking for those who would believe in him. He came into his own. His own received him not. They rejected him. That's what's being said. So we see in these verses, it's talking about the persecuted Messiah. It's talking about his humiliation and his rejection. It's talking about his death on the cross. They're rejecting his sacrifice. And what happened to the nation as a whole when they were rejecting his sacrifice, the nation, darkness came to them. They were in a, a state of rejection, and darkness was what they were left with. When they missed seeing he was Messiah, they went on in their sin, and they as a whole did not turn to him. And we see the nation today still in that darkness. It's not a nation that knows their God. That day will come, but right now it is not. As a whole, the nation has rejected so we do see it's talking about rejection of the Lord Messiah. It's talking about something that they obviously have had a witness in front of them, but they're denying it. They're turning away from it. And that light that they're turning away from is blinding them. Isaiah even says the people who sat in darkness will see a great light. That light will come. It comes to individuals right now and finally the nation as a whole will come into the light and then that light, that glory will sit on the throne on earth and that nation will be in the light of the Lord. We know in the New Jerusalem there's no need of a sun because the Lord is the lamp of it. That's bright light that will blind the unsaved but it opens the eyes of those who believe. So keeping this in mind, go back to Revelation, uh, Romans, sorry, go back to Romans 11 and look at verse 11 then, because here again, we see David saying, may they trip up and fall, may it snare them, may it capture them. And verse 11 says, I, O Paul, say them, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? Again, we're looking at a question structure that means there's supposed to be a negative answer. They didn't stumble so they, they would fall, did they? No. And what does that mean? Stumbling would be the part, falling would be a complete. I've fallen and I can't get back up. Okay? And he's saying they didn't stumble so that they would fall down completely. That's not what's happening. And the they, again, we're talking about the whole nation, the mass of Jewish people. But remember, there's still a remnant. That irrevocable fall, that irremedial fall, the not being able to rise up, is that what God was allowing to happen? And again, his answer is, far from it. May it never be. God forbid. Don't even go there. That's not what's happening. Away with that thought. There's no room for anyone to say, see, God let them stumble and fall. They can't get up. They're done. No, 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 no. Something's going to happen because of that stumbling. That's all they did was stumble but they didn't fall down where they can't get back up, okay? That's the rest of our verse. But by their wrongdoing, by their stumbling, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So through the instrumentality, through the means of the Jewish people as a whole, stumbling 
over the truth. And remember, they would stumble over the cornerstone, who we saw was Yeshua Jesus in the previous lesson. By stumbling, their stumbling, salvation has come. Their, their misstep, their transgression has come to the Gentiles. Because that happened, it opened the door for the Gentiles. Why did it open to the Gentiles? Because God wanted to change his mind and finish off the Jews and move to new people. I don't like them anymore. I'll go over here. <laughs> May it never be. God forbid. Anathema. Far from it. No, he says, May it happen so that the Gentiles will make them Jews. Bad English, but you get my point. Make them Jews jealous. Well, what happens when you're provoked to jealousy? You go back to what you're missing. That's what was to happen. The Gentiles were to awaken the Jews to the fact that, hey, you're stumbling. You're tripping over this, but this is something great. Open your eyes, unclog your ears, hear with your heart, and receive it. Not that you're rejected and can't receive. On the contrary, God's trying all the harder. <laughs> this should bring you in. You didn't want it in the first place. Okay, let me make you jealous for it. Remember my little two-year-old story? The two-year-old's in the room playing with all the toys, happy and content. He's on one side of the room, a door opens on the other side, and there was a toy over there he had played with. He had put that toy down, and he'd gone off, and he was doing his own thing. But that other little two-year-old comes in the room, sees that toy that the first one had played with, and he picks it up, and he loves it, and he's having fun with it. And that original child, what did they do without fail? run across that room as fast as they can, get to that other two-year-old, mine, and then they hold it for themselves. <laughs> I remember a little girl that came to play at the party of my little niece. They were both very young. I think it was a two-year-old party. If it wasn't, it was three, but very, very young. In fact, I think it had to have been two, one to two, actually, because there was a playpen with toys around, so that's how young they were. And even though she was a very good mama and had been trying to teach her child right, she was appalled to see her child, the guest, get into the other child's toys and start picking them all up and trying to, whoa, what happened? <laughs> I don't want to yell at you while my volume suddenly, there we go, okay, now I'm off, I'll holler. <laughs> she was appalled. She said, I've taught her better than that. Well, God taught the Jews better than that, but they were misbehaving, and they were acting like spoiled little brats. But this is what God wanted, was for them to see the value of the ball they had dropped. Look, look at it again. You didn't think you wanted this, but somebody else found great value in it. Maybe you should take another look, and hopefully you'll say, I'm sorry I let that go. I want it too. Not in place of, but I want it too. Look with me at Deuteronomy. Whoops, okay, I messed up my tablet. But Deuteronomy 32 and verse 21. Davarim 32 and verse 21. Deuteronomy 32, verse 21, we read, They have made me jealous with what is not God. They provoked me to anger with their idols. Okay, this is a, a um, condemnation against Israel. They are making God jealous. How do you make God jealous? Having another idol. Very good. Having another idol. Making something else God in their life. He said, I'm a jealous God. I want all of you, not part of you. I want all of you. It's me or it's nothing. I don't share with another. And so they've done this. They've made me jealous. They provoked me to anger with their idols. So if you think I'm saying that, God just said it. Not Rochelle. God just said it, okay? And what's his response? I'm going to kick them out. I'm done with them. I'm going to kick them to the curb and I'm going to choose somebody else. No. God says, you know what I'm going to do because they've made me jealous and provoked me to anger? I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. 
And in that he meant the Gentiles, not that they were foolish people, but they were heathen. They didn't have the ways of God because they didn't have the oracles of God because they weren't in obedience with God. They were out in idol worship. Remember, God chose Abraham and he crossed over from worshiping all these idols to worshiping the one true and living God. And that was the start of what brought it down into the Jewish race. And they were given. Remember Paul said the, the one thing that the Jews had that gave them a, an up was they, were, they had the oracles of God. They had the word of God. They know the truth from the word of God if they will study it. That's what he is saying. And so because they have made me angry, because they've turned to idols. Okay, okay. My bless you both. Will be definitely, okay. definitely keep us posted. But absolutely, and we'll trust the Lord and believe He will. Have yes, it. will. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So sorry, we had a little interruption there, but we'll go on. So He is saying, I'm going to make this people, the Jewish people, I'm going to make them jealous because I'm going to choose another group of people, and when they see that I've chosen these others, it's going to provoke them to jealousy then they're going to want me. That was God's intention. He said that all the way back in Davarim, in Deuteronomy. He did not say that in the generation when Yeshua Jesus was walking on the earth. I mean, he did there too, but that wasn't the original. The original is back in Moshe's day. The original is 1400 to 1500 BC when he's saying, I know what they're going to do. I know they're going to reject. I know they're going to turn away. I know they're going to be rebellious. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be a little bit smarter, and I'm going to find a way to draw them back in. I'm going to do it through another people. I'm going to provoke them to jealousy. That's what's happening and what Paul is expanding on right here and right now. There's a poem, if I can. Um, he drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, thing to flat. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. That's what our God does. That's what he's doing. He's not through with the people of Israel. He is going to provoke them to jealousy, and he is going to use you, dear Gentiles, to do that. And I say, dear, on purpose. And I say, bless you, and I want you to see how important you are, too. You're not a second thought. You are just as loved, and you are very, very important to the picture. And in fact, I think... Yeah, let me get through just a couple more verses here because I'm, I'm seeing we're out of time. But let me tie up with this because I think this will, yeah. I'd like to get through verse 14 real fast. Let's see if I can do it. We've done through 11, so 12. Now, if their wrongdoing proves to be riches for the world, enrichment is going to enrich the world because they're going to receive salvation. They're going to receive it because the, the Jewish people are stumbling, okay? So if their wrongdoing proves to be salvation, rich for the world, and their failure, their defeat, their loss of spiritual blessings, riches for the Gentiles, okay? Again, saying it, how much more will their fulfillment be? So when they do come back, when they are complete, when they're restored to their Messiah, when the Messiah returns, how much greater is it going to be? That's what God's saying. I'm not done with the Jews. I'm working a greater plan. Because of it, I'm going to bring in this whole other people. I'm going to provoke them to jealousy. This people, what do they get for it? They get salvation. They get my grace. They get to be in a special relationship with me. And when they see it and they're brought back by it and because of it, then it's going to be even all the greater for them, for their fulfillment, because they will finally get what they are missing. Let me cross-reference it with you real quickly. Isaiah 49, 6 and 7. If I have to hurry through this, I'll pick it back up next week to give it thoroughly. But I want to get that last thought in here that's coming. Okay, Isaiah 49, 6 and 7. He says, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant? to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the protected ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nation so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Okay, so he's going to use them to take salvation to the ends of the earth. We know 144,000 
and the tribulation will take it to the ends of the earth that it was going out even before then to the ends of the known world in their time and Isaiah 60 again and I quoted this earlier Isaiah 60 and verses 1 through 3 says arise shine your light has come the glory of the Lord has risen upon you for behold darkness will cover the earth deep darkness of people remember they're sitting in darkness because they've rejected the light but the Lord will rise upon you, Israel. His glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light. They're going to come to the light of the Messiah when he's sitting on the throne and Israel ruling and reigning is when we'll see this completely fulfilled. Kings will come to the brightness of your rising. Raise your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come afar. Your daughters will be carried on the hip. Then you will see and be radiant, and your heart will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you, and it goes on. What it's telling them is Israel will reap. She's going to get the benefits when she turns as a nation to her Messiah. Okay, why am I hurrying through that? Because I want you to get this next thought. Verse 13, but I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles. Therefore, insofar as I, Paul, am an apostle of the Gentiles, Paul was sent to the Gentiles. Peter was sent to the Jews. Paul was sent to the apostles, and he said that. He said, but, but I'm speaking to you, and as far as I'm an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. I am going to glorify my ministry. I'm going to honor it. I'm going to be a faithful discharge of it. I'm going to do it honor i'm i'm glad to go to the apostles i'll send you uh, I'll, I'll take you to verses next week to prove how he went to the gentiles okay just take my word for it today but we'll look at galatians ephesians and later in romans to, to prove that point i want to get this final thought for you i magnify my ministry my office my calling i magnify my calling to the gentiles i'm going to do it the greatest that i can why because I'm mad at the Jewish people and I don't like them and they're rebellious people and I want nothing to do with them? Then why do we find Paul in every synagogue when he goes to a new city? Why do we see him look for the Jewish people? Why do we see him give it to the Jew first and also to the Gentile? No, his reason why he's going to do it the best that he can is verse 14, if somehow I may move my own people to jealousy and save some of them. I get it. I see what God's doing. The Gentiles are going to make the Jewish people jealous so they'll come for it. So since my heart's desire is for my Jewish brethren to come to believe, I'm going to get it the best I can to the Gentiles. I'm going to take it out. I'm going to embrace them. I'm going to bring them in. I'm going to give them all of these blessings out of the word of God for them to receive and enjoy and be living in and be showing my Jewish people, look what you're missing so that you'll come in too. That's what's going on here. God's not done with Israel. He's working a greater picture to draw in a rebellious people through another door. Let's say he came in the back door because they locked the front door on him, okay? <laughs> he's coming in, he's drawing them in, and he's using a great little Jewish boy to do it, who wouldn't be if God was done with Israel. And I say, hallelujah, thank God you are not done with Israel. Thank God for raising up Sha'ol Paul to give us the letters he's given us to teach us how to walk in our ways this very day. And that's why I tell you, if you're Jewish, embrace what God wanted to give you in the first place. Don't stumble over the rock of offense. Embrace and receive Yeshua, Jesus, the rock of your salvation. And if you're Gentile, come on in, show Israel. Look how wonderful it is. It's great. You want this too. And guess what? There's enough for everybody. For God so loved the world. I think that's a good place to stop for today. <laughs> so I will come back and pick up this last thought here, but I wanted it to complete because we really looked hard at this blindness and the, this rejection and this willfulness and, and we're struggling with understanding that God is, is bigger than that and greater than that and his plan is more phenomenal than what we could have ever imagined or thought on our own. Do you not see how awesome our God is? And do you not see how loving he is? So that if you are a Gentile who stumbled also or who has walked away in rebelliousness, 
the same as the Jew can come in, you can come in too. God's not willing for any to perish. And I say, hallelujah. <laughs> I love it. Petrus is clapping. Give God a hand. He did it. He does it all. He keeps us. And he is again. amazing. Rowena. Rowena. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Stubborn so we can come in? You can thank the Jews for being stubborn to bring you dear Gentiles in through a beautiful plan that God had preordained knowing. It wasn't a second thought. He said, this is a great plan. It's going to bring in all of my creation. Because if you're not Jewish, you're Gentile. There's no others. You're either unsaved Jewish or saved Jewish, and you're either unsaved Gentile or saved Gentile. But there's no other. You're, you're one or the other. Or as my dad coined the word, you're a Jew tile, which means you're part of a Jew tile, which means you're part Jewish, part Gentile. But that's it. You're in one of those groups. Oh, it's like God, messianic. Yes, messianic. Like a mirror. Yes. I can tell like you a mirror. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I, I love Amir Safadi also. He's a great powerhouse for us. Roger, open the mics. We're going to close in prayer and we'll open it to questions, oh, discussion, whatever. Uh, yes. Yes. That is. Um, moment. I'll give her her name in a moment. I know it well. <laughs> I may have to have her tell you. It'll come back. I'm spent. Let's pray. Lord God of creation, of the universe, Lord God, who is the Savior of the Jew and who is the Savior of the Gentile, thank you for your love. Thank you for a love that will not let us go. Thank you for a love that cannot be severed between us. Thank you that you had a plan to draw all of mankind in. Thank you that whether we are Jewish or Gentile, we can be saved. And Lord, thank you for those of us who have our eyes open and who have embraced and accepted and you have now written it on our hearts. Those of us in that boat, Lord, let us go out. Let us share. Let us provoke the others to jealousy that we can bring them into and they can have the blessings of a relationship with you today and every day they walk on this earth and then home with you forever. Oh, Lord, we say hallelujah, we praise you, we thank you, we adore you. You are an ineffable God. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. How do we always get to these points where I'm ready to explode by the end of class? <laughs> Stop the recordings. Open up for questions, comments. I hope you're all so excited you can't contain it, that you want to go out and tell everybody, hey, go.